My name is John Honey. Uh, I'm the director of the honors program at Emerson College, and thank you all very much for joining us here tonight and giving me the opportunity to share uh, what we do here at the honors program at Emerson. So um, I'll jump right into what things will look like for you uh, as a typical student here at Emerson College and at most any college. So you'll be here for four years, eight semesters, uh, and generally students take four classes each semester. And so, uh, and I know some of you are, are doing a lot of work already before you come in. And so you're gonna bring a, a, a credits with you that will allow you to graduate early. And I'll cover that as we're going along too. So these are all of the classes that a typical student takes. And a question we often get is how does the honors program fit into all of this? Will I have time to, to fit in all the courses for my major and maybe do a minor and some electives that I'm interested in? And so hopefully this will help you to better uh, think about that. So it's 32 courses in all that are required of, of all students. Uh, and that's roughly 11 general requirements. So that's your college writing classes, liberal arts, math, language classes. These are classes everyone has to take. And then everyone has a major and most majors have roughly 12 courses that are required, that are required for that. Some uh, majors have more like performing arts and other majors uh, have, have fewer uh, required courses, but most have at least about 11 courses. Uh, and then so that, that generally leaves space for minors uh, and other electives. And the way that the honors program would fit into that is that, so it's eight classes in all and six of those eight courses uh, count for requirements that you'd have to take anyway. So essentially there's only two extra courses that you'd be responsible for in the honors program. Uh, and, and I'll talk about those tonight. So uh, the first year, there are three courses that everyone's required to take. These cover your writing requirements, your US diversity requirement and your literary requirement. Uh, so uh, 101 and 102 are an interdisciplinary study of literature and culture of the Americas. So they're covering that literary requirement and US diversity requirement. And it's a lot of close reading of literature and writing about that reading and learning also how to write about that reading through the lens, through various uh, the theoretical lenses. So you'll study different theories about how society functions and then you'll examine that literature, literature uh, through those lenses. And then you'll apply those lessons that you've learned in 103 to write uh, a thesis. So you spend that whole class just working on a 20 page thesis. And I know that that may sound uh, long to a lot of you, but you have the whole class to, to develop it. And so uh, you have these three classes that fulfill three requirements. So they're classes or, or requirements you'd have to take anyway, as I mentioned, the literary perspective, US diversity and written communication. And all of these courses are team taught and you'll be with the same group of students through all three courses. So we have three different sections of all of those courses, and you'll be with your same cohort of students through all of those. So it'll help you get to know uh, roughly 15 to 18 other students uh, really well and help to build community as part of the honors program. So that's the first year, and I think that's all I had to say uh, with that. Yeah, so you'll stay with the same cohort. And then in the second year, we have only two courses. One, uh, the 102 course is your required science course, so you'd have to take some version of that anyway, and 202 is your required philosophy course, so you'd have to take some version of that anyway. So these are small, they're, they're different than the conventional versions of the science or philosophy courses in that they're small, just like the other ones were. Um, and they have a unifying theme through uh, across both of them, and that is being human in the changing world. So you examine that theme through the, the disparate lenses of either science or philosophy to understand how do scientists and philosophers think about questions like that? How do they do research? How do they make claims uh, and, and things like that? Uh, and uh, so I already mentioned they fulfill the scientific perspective requirement and, and our philosophy requirement, we call that uh, ethics and values perspective. 
So you fulfill those in the second year. And this is what I just showed you, the science course in 201 and 202. And now we're also looking at your third and fourth year. And these are all the required honors courses uh, that you'll be, or all of the honors courses that you'll be required to take. And this IN3XX, I've got that XX in there because there's just a whole bunch of different ones that you can take. This is just your upper level interdisciplinary requirement that all students have to take. Uh, but you know, you'll be taking this uh, mostly with uh, many other honors students. And you can actually take that course uh, any time during your third year. It doesn't have to be the fall semester. And you could even take it during your fourth year if you want to. So there's lots of flexibility in your schedule if you wanted to take the class earlier or later, depending on how you want to fit in your other classes. And then we have in your final year, your uh, the 390 and the 490 class. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in just a second, but essentially the 390 is where you uh, lay the, the groundwork for your honors thesis, and 490 is where you actually write your honors thesis. I think I'm digging in. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to make the point now that for uh, those of you who are doing a lot of work before you get to college, or maybe you're transferring in from somewhere else, and you've already got credits, and you're planning to graduate early from Emerson, we can accommodate that. You just move those required courses earlier. Uh, and some a very small handful of students are even graduating a whole year early, and we can accommodate that as well. So that's not a problem uh, that you'll have to worry about. So this is a typical student again. And then getting back to your honors thesis. So uh, that's the the basically the capstone of the honors program. And these are the two sort of extra classes that are required to be honors students. So these are above the other six classes that everyone else has to take versions of. So the honors thesis is a 50 to 60 page research paper on a topic of your choosing. Now don't log off just yet, don't, don't be scared because you have a whole year to do this. I know it sounds like a, a huge uh, 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 obligation, but uh, you have that first semester in 390 laying the groundwork, as I said, you, you develop a topic and again, you get to choose it. You develop a proposal, you do research and develop an annotated bibliography where you, uh, and I'm sure you've done things like that before, but you analyze each of your potential sources. Then you also do a literature review where you synthesize all of basically the annotated bi bibliography. And those three documents, the proposal, the annotated bibliography, and the literature review are what are used in your thesis uh, proposal review where you meet together with your uh, 390 professor and the professor in your next class, your thesis class, the 490 class, and with me, and you talk about your ideas for doing your thesis, and we give you a lot of feedback, and this all happens a few weeks before 390 is over. And then you take that feedback that you get from the meeting, and you may do some additional research in new areas, or maybe you'll just start writing on your uh, on your, your draft of your, of your thesis, some of your first drafts, although that's not required. And you do this work plan that I described, which is basically uh, how, what's your timeline for completing your thesis in 490? And then that brings us to 490, where you've got all of the groundwork laid for producing your thesis, and you spend that entire semester writing drafts, submitting those to the professor for review and to your fellow students. There'll be a lot of peer review of that work in your 490 class, and you spend the whole semester workshopping your thesis until at the end you're finished. So uh, it's independent research. Uh, you're working a lot on workshopping your uh, ideas. Uh, and, and then you finish and graduate. And to give you an idea, uh, we accept uh, honors thesis or, or honors students from every major in the college. So the honors theses reflect that, that sort of diversity. Uh, and some students choose to do their honors thesis on something related to their major, and other students choose it uh, to do with something of maybe their heritage or where they where they grew up or where they hope to live in their future or some future career that may not be directly tied to their major. So it can really be anything you want, even, even a hobby, for example. And to give you some of uh, recent thesis uh, title examples, we have this first one, Nature's Narrative Revol Revolution, Defying the Colonial Gaze in Blue Chip Nature Documentaries. Uh, and by these Blue Chip Nature Documentaries, uh, 
uh, the student was thinking of Blue Planet or Planet Earth or, you know, some of those really cool um, recent nature documentaries. And, and the student, uh, the thesis argued that the modern nature documentaries continue to propagate colonial perspectives of land and of peoples that, and that that fact undermines their effectiveness for motivating viewers to adopt more sustainable lifestyles. And the thesis explores the ways that nature documentaries could evolve in the different direction to best help it, the fight against various environmental crises. And then the second one, Billy Willing Backwards, Slaughterhouse Five, Semi Autobiographical Literature and Nietzsche. Uh, that thesis focused on what makes semi-autobiographies semi unique from other types of memory books. And I had never heard of a semi-autobiographical uh, anything, uh, but what it is, it's just an autobiography that has uh, just a kernel of fact in it or various levels of fact and lots of, uh, of made up stuff essentially. Uh, and what the student argued is, is that it's a way that the author can basically will backward their fate uh, and basically relive uh, their life and tell the history of that life in the way that they want to believe that it happened or to basically give their own truth. And I think this was a really great opportunity that this student took to better understand what they were doing, because this student had already written two memoirs and was working on another one. And so she wanted to uh, think about, like, what's what's up with that? What are her motivations? What could she accomplish with that? Uh, and uh, what does it all mean? And I think this was a great opportunity for her to dig into that. And then the next one from Gay Bars to Grinder, Unmasking Spaces for Gay Men in the Digital Age. That, that thesis explored the evolution of safe spaces for the gay male community from physical havens in the 20th century to digitalized platforms in the 21st century. And Drew argued that the digital platforms in the new millennium offered a sanctuary for self-expression and protection from physical threats, but there was also a sort of magnification of, of stereotypes and physical objectification uh, that were prevalent on these online hookup apps uh, like Grindr. Uh, and, and he argued that the future of gay spaces uh, has to involve some dynamic changes in both physical and digital realms that emphasize uh, inclusivity while addressing the potential harms of the way that they manifest today. And then the next one, Trailer Tracks, The Auditory Art of Making Movies. This thesis applied a critical lens to the music used in film trailers. And he argued that film trailers are one of Hollywood's most important marketing tools and, and they're, um, they're given life by the music in them. And we often ignore the music that's going on as we're watching a trailer. It's, it's just in the background, but it's, it's almost, and he argued actually that it's more important than the details of what's happening, the clips of the film that are happening in the trailer. And then Sam, he was a visual and media arts major and now he works in Hollywood helping to actually develop movie trailers. So he was using this as an opportunity to better understand the arts that he intended to pursue after he graduated. And then finally, this next example that I wanted to show you was customization, promotional content, and the culture of digital cosmetics. Young players as a testing ground for a new age of consumerism. And so in that thesis, Kenzie argued that uh, examining video games teaches us not just about the current gaming industry, but the future of the metaverse as a retail space. So she looked at the games Penguin Club and Roblox and argued that the use of promotional content and availability of cosmetic items like skins and the integration of engagement models and inclusion of social communications, like you can talk and write to uh, other players and monetization it, it, all of that together builds brand loyalty in future customers and establishes the metaverse as a retail focused platform. And, and I thought that was a really interesting approach to trying to understand this uh, brave new world that we're all entering as technology advances and, and we follow along behind it essentially. So these are just some ideas of the, of the roughly 50 or so that are published every year by honor students or submitted every year by honor students. Some are, are, are published uh, just to give you an idea of the possibilities uh, that uh, lie before you. All right. So uh, with those, where's I going to go next? Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Ah, yeah. So study abroad. Um, 
that is something we strongly encourage at Emerson College and in the honors program at Emerson College. You guys are probably aware that we have as one of our satellite campuses, a castle uh, in Castile Well in the Netherlands. And we encourage students to go there in their sophomore year, either the fall or the spring semester of their, of their sophomore years. Uh, or a year because we have dedicated honors classes during those semesters. So uh, students don't miss a beat if they go there for their online experience. But if they choose to go somewhere else, we can certainly accommodate that as well. We have some reciprocal relationships with a few other universities like Franklin, Franklin University in, in Switzerland. And if you choose to go somewhere besides the castle is what we call Castile Well, a good time to do that is your third year, your junior year. And we, while we don't have dedicated honors classes in those other schools, we can often find a class uh, that fulfills the interdisciplinary requirement that I described earlier, that upper level interdisciplinary course. Uh, similar courses are, are held at almost every university in the world. So we can usually find you one of those. And often you can find courses that uh, may fulfill a requirement in your major as well. And you can work closely with our Office of Study Abroad to uh, identify those uh, and uh, fulfill some requirements while you're uh, learning about uh, other countries. So that's a possibility in your third year. Uh, and then we also have a campus in Los Angeles that uh, lots of students, uh, if they do go, they like to attend their very last semester because one of the requirements of attending there is that you also do an internship. And a lot of students are hoping that the internship turns into a job. So they take it their very last semester so they can stick around uh, with their new job uh, if, it, if, it, if that works out. And we can take the honors thesis course in uh, Los Angeles. The professor who leads that is actually the academic head of the uh, program in Los Angeles. So you'll definitely be in good hands. And about um, of the honor students who go there, I'd say maybe roughly about a quarter to a third of honor students go there. Uh, there are some, for example, who are in the creative writing program that uh, don't feel the need to go to Los Angeles because it's more uh, focused for VMA students, I think. Uh, although some writers go there to practice uh, screenwriting and other things like that. Uh, of the honor students who do go to Los Angeles, uh, for their final year, about half of them choose to do their thesis there, uh, and the other half choose to do it in Boston before they go uh, to Los Angeles so that they can focus on their work in Los Angeles. Uh, I have not heard any complaints from either group about whether, whether one approach is better than another, uh, and so both of them seem to work really well. Uh, so it's just up to you and how the classes fit into your schedule if you choose to go to Los Angeles, which is not required. So we have those uh, various study abroad, uh, not really abroad for Los Angeles, of course, but study outside of Boston opportunities. And we can accommodate that if you're graduating early as well, uh, just the same way I was describing before. So you just squeeze those down into earlier semesters. So and, and some students uh, have done that. So that's uh, your time here at Emerson College in the honors program uh, in a nutshell. And I think I had a couple other things that I wanted to mention. Yes, uh, yes, it's open to all majors. There are some deadlines that I'm sure you're aware of uh, for early decision one and early action candidates, it's November 15th. And then for early decision two candidates, it's January 15th. And then for regular admission candidates, it's January 31st. So all of you would just do the regular application either on the Common App or the Emerson application. And in addition, you would do an honors essay. So the essay prompt is that uh, the essay has to be four, 400 to 600 words. Uh, and it's essentially that you choose some metaphor that you think is powerful and you explore its potential to be uh, helpful or harmful in your thinking. So uh, a word of advice about that. Um, think about your uh, the reviewers of your application, and they're going to be reviewing hundreds of applications. You will do yourself a gigantic favor 
if you don't use the metaphor, all the world's a stage, or, or the many other really common metaphors. They're wonderful, and you can do a lot with those metaphors, but after the hundredth one of the same metaphor, it's uh, not quite as interesting, and you really have to uh, do a lot with your writing to stand out from the other students who are doing that. So uh, just as a personal, uh, uh, as, as a as an individual who is also a reviewer, I would strongly encourage you to choose something uh, that you think other students uh, might not use. Uh, use something that your one of your grandparents used to say a lot. Use something from one of your favorite songs. Although remember, if it's Taylor Swift, probably 30 other students have used the same metaphor. So, so think about a metaphor that will be unique, but can still uh, you can still use it to tell us about you. Uh, and and that's also what's really important. Besides not being trite with a super common metaphor, use it as an opportunity to tell us about you. Um, and uh, but it's that that's what we really want to know. We want to know uh, what kind of student, what kind of person uh, are you, uh, in order to help us uh, understand you. Uh, and I think you'll be doing yourself a huge favor if you do that. So I know I, I rushed through all of that. Um, my email address is here at the bottom. If you have any questions that we don't get to today, I'm gonna to go ahead and stop sharing so that we have an opportunity to answer some of your other questions. And, and we do have a, a current honors student here, Carly Fisher, who is, is majoring in the performing arts department. Uh, and Carly is gonna tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the honors program from the perspective of an honors student. Uh, because I'm sure that uh, will be meaningful to you in ways that hearing from uh, an old honors director won't be. So Adriana, are th or are there or Carly, are there other questions that you saw in that list or that have been submitted that uh, haven't been covered yet? Um, yeah, there's a couple going. And um, I think what I would love to start with first is just if Carly, you can maybe introduce yourself a little bit, um, let folks know a little about your experience in the honors program, and perhaps what you're working on with your thesis since you're a senior. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Carly. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a senior at Emerson. I'm from Houston, Texas. So came from a, a bit of ways in the country. Um, and I'm a senior and my major is a BFA in theater and performance. Uh, I also have a minor in dramatic writing. Um, and yeah, the honors program, I'm currently in my, in my last year working on my thesis. So I'm in that one class that's the semester right before we uh, write the thesis. So I'm in that pre-thesis seminar right now. Um, just to give a little, tiny spiel about what my thesis is, I guess. Uh, so I'm doing the creative project. So as an option for the thesis, we can choose to do a creative thesis project um, and pair it with an honors thesis paper. Um, so for my topic, for my uh, thesis, I'll be writing a play. Um, and it's a biographical play about a woman named Frances Stelloff who ran a, a bookstore in New York called the Gotham Book Mart. Um, that ended up being a hub for avant-garde writers and internationally people came from all over. Um, so I'm writing a play about this whole thing and then for my uh, thesis section instead of the 50 to 60 page thesis paper I'll be doing a 30 page um, a thesis paper in addition to the play and in the paper I'll be exploring the concept of community spaces for artists and how um, how these spaces are so important and have such an impact on artistic output and and sort of thought. So that's me and that's my thesis. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that a point that, that I didn't mention. Sorry, Adriana, that, that I'll just say a, a couple of things about or add a couple of things to what Carly said. Uh, a lot of majors have a capstone at the very end, just the same way the honors program has the thesis. Uh, and we know that that is, uh, takes a lot of time and effort and focus. And for the, the stu honor students who have majors with those requirements, we allow them, if they want to focus their honors thesis on that capstone or creative project, to do a slightly shorter honors thesis, 30-page thesis, as Carly said. So yes, that, that's also an option. Yes. 
Great. And Carly, could you just talk a little bit about, because we had a lot of questions about this in particular, um, you know, the performing arts majors in particular, some of our other BFA programs um, can be very uh, time consuming on their own. Do you find you have sufficient time and, and um, organization and everything like that to be able to do something like our BFA programs and the honors program at the same time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've definitely found it really fulfilling to focus on both and to be in sort of this BFA um, theater program where my classes are pretty um, pretty rigorous while I'm in them. And then also the honors uh, curriculum is very rigorous as well. So I found that, um, yeah, it's honestly been kind of nice because for the, my major, at least theater and performance in the classes is sort of the bulk of the work we're doing. And we of course have assignments and things, but oftentimes it'll be like work in the class and then a few readings as well for our classes for theater and performance um, or sometimes rehearsals. Uh, so I've really been able to devote a lot of time to my readings for the honor pro honors program, um, especially in um, my first year, first two years where we had a bit more of a um, defined curriculum with the classes we were taking. Um, so yeah, I've definitely found that the things that I've read, uh, for the honors curriculum have enriched and, and, um, bolstered the work that I'm doing in my major as well in theater. And it definitely is very interdisciplinary and all goes into one another. Um, and I've also got a, a handful of friends who are theater majors, um, who do the honors program. And of course the largest major at Emerson is our, um, visual media arts major. And so a lot of the honors program is also the film majors, which is another BFA. Um, and I found that everyone brings in their own perspective um, in their art and in their major into our into our, our honors classes discussions. And it just really makes it very fruitful because uh, people are bringing in firsthand experience from different uh, interests. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I think we may work backwards a little bit and talk about um, some of these questions regarding the essay first. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions we have here, John, um, is, you know, how strict are we about the definition of metaphor, particularly where some folks may, um, particularly culturally or otherwise, consider um, allegory or parables or things like that? Can you just talk a little bit about you know, what we kind of tend to look for in the honors essay? Well, I personally don't care, right? Uh, we we just want to know about you. And first of all, so we're doing two things with the honors essay. We're looking at like how uh, good are you at communicating your ideas, uh, and, and who are you as a person? What do you care about? What are your values? So uh, if you can do that, uh, then it doesn't matter. I mean, you can use similes. We're not going to care if you use like or as. Or, or if you use some other sort of uh, form, like you said, the, the parables, uh, for example. Uh, we just want to uh, see what sort of writer you are uh, and what sort of person you are. But I wouldn't take it too far. Uh, I, you, sh you should still have some sort of, of saying, I, I would guess. And that may be a way to, to characterize it. Yeah, I would say it's certainly easier for us to to help identify because keep in mind, we're not somebody who's necessarily um, familiar with what you're writing about or anything like that. So just keeping in mind that a stranger is reading this and, and needs to understand it um, is often a good place to start. Um, but yeah, we've, we've received all manner of things. And as long as it's clear to us what you're saying, um, that does account for a large part of it, certainly. Um, one of the other questions about the essay um, I'm happy to tackle is um, because there's that extra time to submit it, how do you do that if you've already submitted your common application by the regular deadline? Um, so basically, once you apply to Emerson, you receive a confirmation email, and in that email will be access to an Emerson-specific portal. And that will have a checklist in it for you of all of the things you've submitted, all the things we're waiting to receive for your application, both for your regular application and any financial aid things. Um, and in that spot will also be a place to upload your honors essay. So you can do it right in that portal. As long as you do it by the honors essay deadline, you're good to go. If you have any trouble with that, you're certainly welcome to email it to us as well. Um, the general admission email is fine, and I'll paste that later, but it's admission at emerson.edu. Um, 
There's a question here that I don't know that I've actually explicitly received before. I think I know the answer, but John, in case you have something different to say, um, can you do the honors program and any of the four plus one programs that Emerson offers? So the Yes, absolutely. uh, five year programs. Yeah, uh, I, I just talked with a student who is doing that uh, right now. She finished her honors thesis last spring, uh, and now she started on the one part of her graduate degree. And, and so if you're not familiar with that, the four plus one is where you take your four undergraduate years or you do your four undergraduate years, you get your undergraduate degree. But at the same time, you are taking some graduate classes And so your uh, plus one year, you take all graduate uh, classes and you graduate with a master's degree. So yes, uh, I've met at least one student who's done that. And I've uh, talked to several students who uh, have been thinking about that. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, the way the honors program works is that I'm the major advisor for students in their first and, and first year and the first half of their second year. And then they also get a major advisor, so an, a, an advisor from their major, and that major that advisor helps them uh, navigate through the courses that are required for their major. Uh, and so, especially if like a student is in one of those four plus one programs where they they have a, a specific pathway they have to take, uh, that's negotiated within their major department, and uh, I'm mostly hands off, uh, and the students are just taking. those last three uh, honors requirements of their last two years of a, as an undergraduate. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one question here about the, the thesis in particular. Um, there seem to be a large range of topics for the theses. Um, are there any restrictions as to what students can write about? Any like no-go topics or things that we would prefer they not go to? I, I, I haven't encountered one. I mean, you have to take it seriously uh, and in a scholarly way and, and examine it through uh, uh, one or more theoretical lenses, your, whatever topic you're interested in. Uh, and, and, and you can use these lenses to critique the theory, uh, to add on to the theory, to fill in gaps uh, that the original theorists uh, left or that, that you see. Uh, so you can do that in many different ways. Excellent. Um, and then similarly, um, we were talking a bit about, you know, Carly and how you're formatting your thesis around some of your creative work. Um, someone asked about being able to do a film. Are there other things that folks can kind of pair with this thesis? Um, and I don't know, either John or Carly, if you can maybe talk about an example or two that you've seen of maybe some of the other majors and what their capstone or theses projects tend to look like. Um, I can offer an example if not. Yeah, I, I've seen several examples and they're all over the place. We we have an, an IDS major, an individually designed major where students uh, basically, it's just what it sounds like. They design their own major. Uh, and one student uh, did her uh, major looking at uh, various uh, gender theorists. Uh, and uh, then the student did their honors thesis uh, on a related topic. So uh, it could be like that. Uh, we had uh, Sam who was doing his on trailers. He uh, was actually, you know, as I said, he's a, VM, a visual and media arts uh, student. So he produced uh, uh, some visual uh, art for his capstone and he did his thesis related to that. So uh, it could be any any range of, of, of stuff, uh, as long as it's a major creative work, like part of your major capstone, uh, then yes, we allow you to uh, focus your thesis on that and do a shorter thesis. Yeah, I had a friend who graduated last year who was a creative writing major, and she was focusing on um, queer storytelling in, in fairy tales and in from a while ago. And for her creative writing thesis or capstone, she um, wrote, I think, I believe it was a short story or some kind of a few chapters of a few things. So that was her creative writing capstone and paired it with her honors thesis about the history there with fairy tales. I'll say, um, I'll use my own example, is that um, I was a political communication student. So my capstone was very much centered around developing a um, 
advocacy campaign. So I was able to use that as part of it, along with, as John is saying, the the shortened then analytical paper to go along with it. Um, so really any of our majors, um, those capstone or thesis components can can be a, a contributing factor. Yeah. And I'll say for, for my creative thesis as well, the play that I'm writing isn't actually attached to any sort of capstone because the BFA in theater and performance major doesn't have a capstone. But I'm, of course, using things that I've learned in my classes in those majors in it, but it's technically not attached to another class in my major. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to some um, what I'll kind of categorize as, as technical questions just for a minute, um, because then I would like to wrap with some questions about um, what we see is some of the benefits of the honors program, um, what you've taken from it, Carly, as well. Um, but let me start with some of these other things. So um, we have a few folks asking how many students are usually accepted to and then are in the honors program. So um, ultimately, we're looking for a class of about 50 students total for each uh, year. Um, so we uh, accept a few more than that to get to that final number, um, because, of course, um, some folks may decide to attend or not. But um, ultimately, that's the size. Um, it varies from year to year, but essentially that puts us at somewhere between usually like a 20 to 25 percent um, rate, acceptance rate. Um, anything else in regards to that, John? Um, not that I can think of. You handle the admission stuff more than I do. I just read the essays and decide whether or not this would be a great student. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are great students, to be to be fair. Um, when do you find out if you're accepted to the honors program? Um, so essentially with your admission decision, you would also find out if you've been admitted to the honors program. And this perhaps raises a good point that um, is good to emphasize that you do need to apply to the honors program in the same round as your overall application. So in other words, if you're applying early action with your overall application, you have to apply to honors by the early action honors deadline. Um, so you can't get your admission decision and then, and then decide to apply to the honors program, you have to do it all at once. Um, so we just let you know at the same time if you were admitted to the honors program. Um, John, what would you say is the like ideal profiles, like some of the academic attributes plus some of the non-academic things that we look for for students that we're admitting to the program? Well, we, we do like students who have a, a wide range of interests. So we it is always a benefit if you've participated in clubs or your student government or uh, sports on campus. Uh, if you have hobbies, uh, other extracurricular things, if you have a life uh, besides just uh, your studies. Uh, that's always uh, a benefit in your profile, for sure. Absolutely. We review applications holistically for our general admission purposes, and we we still do that for the honors program as well, just perhaps at a, a slightly heightened level. And, um, and I left out jobs. So if, if you've uh, been working, tell us. Tell us about the other stuff that you've been doing as well. That That's really important information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I accidentally just closed out a question that someone asked, so I want to make sure to answer it before I forget. Um, if if for some reason we aren't able to welcome you to the honors program, that does not affect your admission to the college. We would decide that um, separately um, and first before we considered you for the honors program. So um, two, two separate conversations, essentially. Um, how do AP credits, and I saw someone I think ask about IB at some point, um, carry over to the honors program? So um, let me talk about the technical part for a minute, and then we can talk about how that affects the classes you have to take in the honors program. So we do accept fours or fives on the AP exam for credit, um, six or seven generally for uh, higher level IB courses. Uh, C or better in dual enrolled classes as well, we will accept for credit at Emerson. Um, so you do receive the credit for those classes. But John, for example, if I took a history AP exam and I got a five, do I still have to take 
the honors class that maybe addresses that topic or maybe science would be a better example. Yeah, science would be the good example. Yeah. So there are some liberal arts requirements like history and psych social psychology uh, that your AP IB uh, courses uh, would could replace. But if it happens to be an honors course like science or literature or uh, or philosophy, then uh, you get to keep the credits that you bring in. So they would contribute to the required 128 credits that you need to graduate, but it wouldn't count for that subject matter requirement in honors because we do want you to participate in those in all of the honors courses. So you you still get credit for your hard work. You haven't done that all for naught. Uh, but it just gets turned into what we call an elective. Uh, so it just doesn't count as one of your requirements. Thank you. Um, Carly, if you can maybe start with this one, um, and then uh, John, feel free to contribute as well. Um, someone was asking about the benefits of doing the honors program, specifically for the four plus one, but could you just talk generally about like what are the benefits of doing this program? What do you feel like you're getting out of it? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I will definitely say that the honors, being in the honors program has been one of my very favorite parts of being a student at Emerson. I found the classes to be just so interesting. And I found um, the level of, of trust that the professors have in us, like knowing that they accepted us into the honors program for a reason, and we're all there to learn and be in the same environment. Um, and so there's just a level of trust that I found is placed in us students and in us as a community and a class. Um, and that manifests itself in like really wonderful conversations in class, like I said before, where people are bringing, <clears throat> excuse me, all of their different interests in and their very um, unique perspectives on what we've read and the material we're coming to class with. Um, I also found in my very first year, the honors program was the most, the curriculum the first year is the most um, sort of uh, full for the honors. And so I found that that is a great was such a great transition year into my first year of college. Like I was just in these really cool classes where I was reading amazing things. Um, and it really just inspired me to be a new student at college and totally um, splayed out into the rest of my career here. Um, and just that very first year in the second semester, getting to do the mini thesis of around 20-ish pages. Mine was actually like 28 pages. <laughs> um, I got to work one-on-one -on -one with, uh, two of one-on-one -on -one with two professors because it was a co-taught course with two professors um, and got to really develop an idea that was uh, pressing for me and like questions that I had. And I just got to dive into the questions and really follow a line of research that was really exciting to me and that, and that encouraged it. Um, and then, yeah, I've, all of the professors I've had have just been so knowledgeable in helping guide my research and helping to guide my own interests within uh, what I'm working on. Um, and we really use the material that the professors have brought into class as a jumping off point too for like, yes, we're engaging with this material and how can we use it to jump off into my own personal research and as sort of a structure for that. Um, so that's been my experience. And then now I'm just really excited about spending this whole year working on my senior thesis. Um, it feels like such a, like a noble project that I get to spend two semesters working on and working closely with my cohort of students and things. And um, I just know I'm in the thick of it now, but it will feel so satisfying by the end to like have something sort of figured out and some questions answered and something I'm really proud to share. So. Yeah, I, I don't think I can give a better answer than that, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with all of that completely. And, I, and I've heard the same testimony from lots of other students. It, it's to me, it, it's a lot like uh, a sort of like a communal master's program uh, as, a, as an undergraduate, because the, the, the level of intensive research that you do uh, uh, working closely with professors uh, or other advisors, if, if you want to recruit some other experts to help you and the collaboration with your fellow uh, honor students, uh, I think is really rich and rewarding uh, and teaches you uh, how to do that research, how to do that uh, analysis, how to do the communication of your ideas. And you're getting to dig into uh, what really interests you. Uh, 
and and you get to decide what really interests you. It's not imposed upon you at all. Uh, and I just think it's a really wonderful opportunity uh, to learn more about yourself, learn more about the world, and prepare for next steps after graduation. Um, just to wrap things up, um, can we each just give a, a quick piece of advice for you know a student who is uh, considering applying to Emerson and applying to the honors program? What should they keep in mind? Um, uh, Carly, can we start with you if I'm not putting you on the spot too much? Well, of course. Um, yeah, a lot of the things that I've emphasized throughout. Um, um, sorry, can you ask it one more time, actually, to make sure I'm getting that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just just a piece of advice for someone who's considering the honors program, um, particularly, I mean, from your perspective as someone who's now gone through most of it, what what might you uh, wish you had known when you were uh, a senior in high school considering this program? Yeah, I think we wish I had known maybe that um, they really or when reviewing, I think you guys could speak to this, but I got the sense and then getting here that my little honors essay and things, they really wanted to feel my voice coming through and who I was. And it wasn't necessarily even about the perfect quality of my writing or um, the metaphor that I chose or whatever. It was really about like the way that I was exploring it. And it has, I think the honors program really just encourages like creative thinking in a lot of ways, which has been a really wonderful pairing with my, of course, creative BFA major. Um, but yeah, just like something that you're passionate, whatever sparks your sparks your flame is, I think, what you should put into your uh, application and also into your first year at Emerson. Um, keep following whatever uh, lights up your eyes. And I think that's what's been encouraged for me and what's been the most exciting and making research that maybe can seem really daunting or texts that can seem really daunting following my own personal kernel of what interests me has been in both encouraged and the most fulfilling part of it. So follow your kernel of interest. I think that's right. Uh, and again, I, I'm hard pressed to try to add to that. The The only thing that uh, I can think of immediately is, is a pattern that I've seen in many students uh, so many, and, and beyond even first year, so many honors students, uh, especially in the first and second year, have uh, some form or another of imposter syndrome, where they are convinced that they barely got into the program and everybody else in the program is so much smarter than them. Uh, and uh, in my experience, everyone that we admit admit is, is just crazy smart and crazy interesting. And uh, so... Uh, when you do get accepted, you just know that you belong uh, and you fit in with everybody else uh, and ask lots of questions, play your part, relax. Uh, everything will be wonderful. Don't be nervous about uh, whether or not you belong or not. Pieces of advice, absolutely. Um, or I think we're going to wrap things up here. So we thank you all for being with us. I'm going to post just a couple uh, of things in the chat. It's probably going to look like a bit of a, a block of text, but hopefully some of it is helpful for you. So um, please feel free to keep in touch with us um, on some of the various platforms. I've included the admission email there as well. Um, as well as the YouTube where this video will be posted. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it will be emailed to registrants as well. So you'll get that link in your email. Um, there's also some links there if you are wondering who your regional admission counselor is. Um, that's the first link. You can register for upcoming webinars via the second link. And we do also have a digital week of engagement coming up in November, and emails will be going out about that soon. So we'll have further sessions and information available for you there. Um, and you can also sign up to chat with a current student. Um, if you'd like, students can do that um, by clicking that last link there. Um, so for now, we thank you everyone for joining us. We hope this was helpful to you. Um, if you're attending in a browser, there'll be a quick survey after the webinar where you can uh, give us some feedback and help us uh, come up with anything you'd like to hear about in the future. Um, but we hope to see you at the next one and look forward to reading all of your wonderful uh, applications and honors essays. So take care, everyone. And I'd like to wish luck to the parents and guardians out there too. 
uh, you will get through this uh, and you'll watch your student grow. It'll be wonderful. I went through this last year and my daughter's in her first year of college now. And it's just been fantastic to watch her grow in, in that experience. And, and the same thing will happen uh, with you. So congratulations on moving through this period. Absolutely. All right. Good night, everyone. Take care.